Well, good evening, and welcome to the Dr. Max Pickerel Lecture Series. And if you haven't been to one of these before, this is something that is provided for you, for the community, at no cost as a result of anonymous donations. And so we always want to begin by thanking those who make donations that make uh, these lectures possible. Uh, now, this evening, we have someone that is going to be speaking for us who is a personal friend. Uh, we had offices nearly adjoining each other here on campus for about 10 years. And uh, we got very well acquainted that way. And also, he and his wife, Sherry, and their two daughters, uh, who are not with us this evening, uh, they also attended the same church as uh, I attend. And so we got to know them in that way as well. Uh, I'm speaking of Dr. Chris Price. Uh, Chris is a, I, I guess you would say, more than a lifelong learner. He is a scholar. And I consider him an intellectual. Now, my definition of an intellectual is someone that says, well, since I can't find anything good to read, I guess I'll just go ahead and write a book. And uh, that's kind of who Chris is. Uh, one of the things that was inspiring having him right there uh, near me was that he was always studying. He was always reading. He was always thinking. And uh, he has, uh, in addition to what you read in your programs, he has continued to uh, get academic degrees He's picked up two additional master's degree and a doctor's degree. And so uh, he is a scholar's scholar, a terrific person, a good man. Uh, so join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Chris Price. All right, thanks, Mark. <laughs> I don't know who he was talking about there, um, to be quite honest with you. Um, but anyway, it's good to be with you. Uh, it was good to be in Colby for nine years. I taught over in Bedker, and um, I just really enjoyed it. I want to thank everybody here for coming out tonight. Uh, it's been good to be in town. As Mark said, we uh, attended church together. He's the pastor, Jim back there. Uh, so we met up uh, with both the Myers and the Carltons. Had lunch with Mike Thompson, a friend of mine, uh, who we would converse with all the time. So it was good to, you know, reach out and talk to him for a bit uh, yesterday. And it, it's just been good to get with people that uh, were such a big part of our lives for nine years. Uh, now I'm in West Virginia. And that's where I grew up. So you may be wondering, you know, how does a guy from West Virginia wind up in North Dakota and then Kansas? And why does he write about the big pandemic on the prairie, which deals with Spanish flu in North Dakota? So anyway, it sort of rolls around <laughs> that this little thing called COVID-19 broke out. I don't know if you've heard of that or not. COVID-19 was the pandemic that we're still sort of dealing with a little bit. But uh, when it was coming out, a lot of people are freaking out. You know, this is something that's unprecedented. We've never gone through anything like this before. You know, public restrictions and things like that. But actually, we have as a country. Now, we might not have done that personally, just us, but as a nation, yeah, they've had, you know, restrictions on things before. And so the Spanish flu could be an analog, something we could look at to see how, you know, a previous generation dealt with something relatively similar. So I looked at the Library of Congress website. I found out that they have a Chronicling America database, which goes into various historical newspapers. And through these historical newspapers, you can find out how a previous generation dealt with things. So I started out, we had a situation where the pandemic hits right around spring break, and then our administration says, hey, we're going to take a couple of weeks off, and then you can come up with online classes and move that direction because we don't know if we're coming back at all. So I was like, okay. Um, I've just gotten through World War I. I knew the Spanish flu was out there, and the question is, how can I, you know, sort of, alleviate some of the concerns maybe that my students are having. So I came up with a lecture on Spanish flu 
And then I found this Library of Congress Chronicling America database, and I had personal ties to three different places, West Virginia, Kansas, where I was working, and then North Dakota, where I went for my doctorate. So West Virginia had all of two newspapers available at that time, neither of which was, you know, a daily paper in a major city. And North Dakota had three daily papers, and all of them are on the website. So there we go. Colby was not one of the papers. So the three major dailies are available in North Dakota. It's about that time that this showed up. <laughs> you know, things are unprecedented. So we have protests going on like this guy here. And through what I'm learning, I'm learning that it's not unprecedented. So... I got a passage of scripture up here that I want to play out, you know, as a man of faith. Nothing new under the sun from Ecclesiastes, you know. And it's kind of disconcerting in some ways, but it's kind of uh, helpful and, you know, comforting in others, you know. Other people have dealt with things. Uh, so this is not unprecedented. And that's one lesson from this picture. The other le uh, lesson from this picture you know, everybody's saying, this guy's yelling at cops. He's like, I wasn't yelling at cops. I was yelling between them at someone standing back there. So it's a lesson, you know, don't take what people are telling you at face value necessarily. That's left, right, mainstream, you know, organizations. Sometimes they have a spin. <laughs> and that. so I think that's a lesson you can learn from that. So anyway, I did have some background knowledge. I knew that the Spanish flu was very deadly. In some communities, some nations, maybe 5%, 10% of the population died who got it. In other nations where, you know, medical care, where uh, things like nutrition are not as strong, more people die. So maybe 20 25%, 30%. I knew that it took place during a global war, which was World War I, and that was you know, something that helped the spread because people are in really tight quarters in the trenches and that allowed the disease to sort of mutate and change and become more deadly. Governments took steps to curb the spread. They engaged in social distancing, they put in place public meeting bans, and they also requested, or in some instances required, the wearing of the infamous mask, okay? So these were, some, these were things that were not unlike what was going on during COVID-19. Now you can't say it's kind of unprecedented the length of time that the public uh, restrictions, you know, the non-pharmaceutical interventions took place during COVID-19, but they're not different in kind in, in, in what was going on. There were public fears at the time. Whoops, went one too far. Uh, government was not honest during the war. They put in these restrictions and they also put out and they encouraged newspapers to put this out. You know, there's nothing to worry about. Wear masks, don't go to church, don't go to school, but there's nothing to worry about. Conflicting messages there. And newspapers follow suit because stopping the spread is considered a war measure. And if you have a war measure, you have to follow that. Or you might have a situation where you might run afoul of the, uh, the Sedition Act, this little law that got passed where people get locked up for speaking against the government and hurting the war effort, theoretically. And there's also that fear that, hey, they're stripping our freedoms away. So anyway, when I started looking at this, I decided, hey, I can, you know, look at these North Dakota newspaper articles and maybe make an article out of it. It was published in North Dakota history a couple of years ago. Um, you can see the picture. You can also see the date, 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. The subtitle is uh, North Dakota newspapers changing coverage, I believe. Um, but I didn't take a picture of that because this was from the interwebs. Uh, but anyway, that went out there. And as I'm doing this research, I find that, you know, well, I already knew this. Newspapers are basically the only media that's out there at that time. You can go to public lectures like this. And at the time, people would have showed up because, you know, America's Got Talent is not on at the time. <laughs> you know, you don't have TV. 
you don't have the interwebs, you do have the newspaper. So this is the primary way that public health officials are able to get their message across to people. So I, as I'm reading these newspaper articles, I'm finding more information that interests me and more questions that I want to ask. So I come up with a strategy. Read some major works for context. And these are two of the strongest books that are out there, two of the more well-known, I guess. Probably the best is the one on the right, or the, the, the most uh, popular, we'll say. That's The Great Influenza by John Barry. Came out in 2004, and I got the 2018 edition, which was before COVID was a thing. But this was very influential uh, for George W. Bush, the president. And he brought up a pandemic task force and all these things uh, because he was concerned that, you know, there might be a new flu pandemic or something come out. Uh, the other is America's Forgotten Pandemic, and it was published earlier under a different name in 1976. This is a 2003 book. And those are probably the two biggest. I read some others, uh, maybe one of which I will refer to here. But I want to talk about Crosby for a moment. So Crosby is famous because he's like one of the original uh, uh, environmental historians, right? And he's famous for this book he wrote called The Columbian Exchange, which looked at, you know, the interaction between the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere in the wake of Chris. Christopher Columbus, right? Diseases were spread, you know, Europeans got syphilis, which wasn't good. Native Americans got things like measles and smallpox, and that was a lot worse, right? Because it kills like 90% of them off. Uh, but anyway, Crosby's an eminent historian, but he argues, and, and I'm reading this, and I look at it, and he says, only the Great cities provide info for tracking the flu through their public health reports and their daily newspapers. And I'm finding that's just not entirely accurate. Okay? Small states like North Dakota and presumably Kansas, I didn't really look into it, they have health reports. They definitely have daily newspapers that are giving you a blow-by-blow -blow detail of what's going on at the time. North Dakota is no exception. So I've basically got a book manuscript out on this. The working title is Big T Pandemic on the Prairie, Spanish Flu in North Dakota. Uh, and the sources I used were those North Dakota newspapers that I found through Chronicling America, uh, three, daily, or, yeah, three daily papers, the Bismarck Tribune, the Fargo Forum and Daily Republican, and the Grand Forks Herald. There were smaller weeklies. Uh, I like this one, The Devil's Lake World and Interocean was one title. Uh, you have the Ward County Independent out of Minot, which is one of the top three leading cities in terms of population, but they only have a day, I'm sorry, a weekly paper. Bismarck was one of the, I think it was fourth. It was less than 10,000 people, but since it's a state capital, it has a daily. Uh, I went to the State Archive in Bismarck. Uh, I, I did have a grant, but then I left Colby, so I didn't get to take the grant. But I still went <laughs> to the State Archive in Bismarck. I had a friend there. Initially, I had asked him to basically um, photocopy or uh, scan things in and send me that. But then I was finding, you know, there's a whole lot more here, and I really just need to go to Bismarck and look at it. So I spent a week there looking at primarily religious bodies, uh, their records. I looked at also the Red Cross records from all of the counties. They had all of those there. Uh, then I got the McCracken Research Library of the Buffalo Bill Center of the West in Cody, Wyoming to scan in some things. I'll mention one of those here in a minute. That was in Cody, Wyoming, and I only needed a little bit, so I paid $25 instead of driving 10 and a half hours and spending a couple nights there, you know. And they were gracious enough to send me what I needed. Then I looked at some government documents that were on the Library of Congress's website, primarily Bureau of Indian Affairs information. So superintendents of the various Indian reservations have to give periodic reports to you know, the BIA offices in Washington, D.C., and that can give you sort of an idea of what's going on on the, the reservations at the time. So to give you sort of a, a context of what's going on at the time, the first chapter of the book looks at sort of like where medical studies, where the medical field is at the time. So at the turn of the 20th century, basically one in 10 people fails to reach their first birthday. 
That means the infant mortality rate is about 10%. Furthermore, one in three die before they reach the age of five. Okay? So that means that, like, I don't know, we got, like, 20 people in here. That means, like, six or seven of us would have been dead before we're five. You know, obviously the age range in here is skewing a little bit older than that. So we have modern medicine to thank for that, right? The expected life expectancy for everybody is about 50. Infectious diseases are bad, but we're getting into a point where germ theory is starting to be understood. Uh, you know, Edward Jenner has gone through with the smallpox inoculation process, which smallpox inoc inoculation actually existed in the medieval period, in the Islamic world, and in Africa. And I don't know if you know this or not, but what it involved was lancing your skin and basically taking the pus out of someone who had smallpox and then inserting that into the cut that you have. <laughs> and hopefully it gives you a very weak case of smallpox. And if it does, then you'll be able to survive and have immunity. If not, you die. Okay. Uh, Cotton Mather, I don't know if you've heard of him, he was a Puritan minister in New England. He had pushed for that, um, and he had, like, bricks thrown through his window because there were people saying, you know, it's God's will, you'll die of smallpox, so don't take the inoculation. And uh, Jonathan Edwards, the eminent theologian from New England with the Great Awakening, he actually died from smallpox inoculation. Um, so you have that. Um, Edward Jenner figures out that milkmaids who had gotten cowpox don't get smallpox. So they started, you know, inoculating with that, and it was a whole lot safer <laughs> than the real deal. Uh, so anyway, this guy John Snow in London figures out that cholera comes from contaminated water. He figures out, okay, this one contaminated, you know, <laughs> outlet of water that people are drinking at. They're getting cholera an awful lot. This one that's a lot cleaner, not so much. So that allows people to understand, hey, cholera comes from contaminated water. If we cut off the contaminated water supply, no more cholera. So they stop that. Uh, yellow fever is eradicated by William Gorgas of the United States Army. Uh, they figure out that mosquitoes are the vector that causes that. So eradicating mosquitoes in a given area, you know, it keeps you from getting the yellow fever, also malaria. Uh, plague is contained, sometimes by really extreme measures. Honolulu, for example, there was a plague outbreak in Chinatown. They burnt Chinatown down, basically, in Honolulu in the late 19th century, with the exception of the uh, Occidental Hotel, I believe was the name of it, and it was a white-owned business in the middle of Chinatown. They left that but the Chinese buildings, they, they burned down, and the ones that were in the, in the community, but the winds in Hawaii are pretty bad, so they also burnt down a lot of adjoining buildings as well. But they did figure out how to contain the plague. There were vaccines or serums against anthrax, tetanus, typhoid, and other diseases, and Barry points out that, you know, medical professionals have a lot of uh, you know, this idea, hey, we can conquer any disease. There was a belief that maybe, hey, infectious disease might be eradicated entirely in short order. Obviously, that didn't work. <laughs> uh, but this is kind of where medical science is at the time. As far as Spanish flu generalities, the origin, uh, John Barry argued for Haskell County, Kansas, Okay, uh, he's kind of moved away from that, but the argument was this Dr. Loring Miner there, uh, he figures out that there's this really bad flu going on that's killing some people, and he's going to argue that, you know, we need to do something. He sends information to the U.S. Public Health Service, who does nothing. But anyway, somebody who's training for World War I comes back to Haskell County from training, then goes back to Camp Funston in Fort Riley and spreads the flu from there, and people die in March of 1918. Crosby argues that's possible, but he also points to a couple of other outbreaks pretty much at the same time, one at a Ford factory in Detroit and one at San Quentin. Yes, that San Quentin, the prison. <laughs> uh, they take place in early 1918 as well. There was a 1927 AMA study that noted, quote, a purulent 
bronchitis that basically filled up the lungs and coughed out the bloody sputum that is described with the Spanish flu. So that was in France in the winter of 1916 and 17. Uh, a guy by the name of Christopher Langford later suggested China. Canadian historians, including Mark Osborne Humphreys, I read one of his books, he argues for Europe in the winter of 1917 or 18. And the answer of where it starts is nobody really knows for sure. <laughs> uh, North America or Europe seem to be the more likely uh, places of origin. So uh, Spanish flu also dealt with antigenic drift versus antigenic shift. <laughs> so what's an antigen and what is antigenic shift versus drift? So an antigen is that part of a foreign body that the body recognizes as a foreign invader and then your immune system kicks in. So in influenza, if you've seen the H1N1, it's hemagglutin and neuraminidase. Okay, so that's the H is hemagglutin, neuraminidase is the N. And then the first one that they find is one, second one is two, and, and you get the idea right? So the body sees that. In an antigenic drift, you know, it changes a little bit, but the body can still recognize that there is an invader. In an antigenic shift, the things get changed up so much that the body, the immune system, can't recognize what's going on until the disease-causing agent has replicated so much in your cells that you've gotten really sick, okay? So they think that what happens during Spanish flu, which didn't actually start in Spain, I hope you know that, right? <laughs> um, it's called Spanish flu because it's wartime and places like London, Berlin, and France, ha Paris, they have censorship in place of the media. Spain was neutral, they don't. So they put out there, hey, the king has the flu. So then it becomes known as Spanish flu. So they think it's a, an antigenic shift. It spreads globally, and it is spread by wartime conditions. Uh, some evolutionary biologists have figured that the fact that you're sending people sick from the front lines behind the lines and then sending healthy young people to the front lines caused it to go through what's called passage, so that the pathogen gets stronger immediately. So that's one of the... Uh, theories as to how it becomes so deadly uh, to kill that many people. In the United States, there are three waves. You may have heard of that. This is something from the uh, CDC's website. And the three waves, spring of 1918, fall of 1918, which is the second wave, which we'll primarily talk about, and then also a third wave in the winter of 1918 and 19. Barry points out, other people have pointed out, the flu continues until 1920 or 1921. Uh, the second wave is interesting because most of the time the flu causes deaths in really young people, like before five, really old people, older than 65 or 70. This flu is different because it's killing people who are in the 20 to 40 range. So you'll see the normal flu death playing out with the, the dotted line there. Spanish flu is with the solid line. You see sort of a W instead of a U. Um, they think it's cytokine storms. Cytokines are proteins that basically tell the immune system, the white blood cells, to go attack an invader. In a cytokine storm, they produce so many that they start to attack healthy cells and kill them. Um, so people that died in 12 to 48 hours probably had those. Uh, there are people who die of secondary infections, primarily pneumonia. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute as well. So anyway, estimated there are 675,000 deaths in the United States, possibly something like 50 million worldwide. So it is truly a global pandemic, and it is COVID-19 kind of on steroids in terms of death. So consequences for North Dakota, this is what I was primarily looking at. Number one, I looked at restrictions. Second, I looked at the medical advice they were giving. Then I looked at a political campaign because this happened during an election year. I looked at religious bodies because he, he mentioned I got a couple of theology degrees, I think, and I studied religious history. That's kind of what my doctorate was focusing on. Um, 
So I was interested to see how they reacted. And then I looked at minorities, which was basically Native Americans because there weren't many other minorities in North Dakota. Um, so that was the only ones that were in any number. So it spread in North Dakota. Uh, it gets there through international transports from the military and civilians. They bring Spanish flu over in late summer 1918. So if it started in North America, then it transferred over to the trenches where it got worse. That bad strain came back to the United States in late summer 1918. It first hit army cantonments where people are training, and you can see this in the newspapers. It hits camp, uh, this camp, Camp Upton in New York, for example, Camp Devons near Boston, and then a couple days later, you'll see, oh, it's in the community, and then, oh, lots of people are dying, <laughs> and, you know, nothing to worry about, though, as I said. Um, so anyway, Bismarck Tribune argued on October 4th, 1918, that the state's attorney general, a guy by the name of William Langer, he's known as Wild Bill Langer, was the first case in North Dakota. That was an erroneous assumption. There were cases in New Rockford. Uh, it is estimated they were seated in September, right around September 14th, by a guy back from the military. You know, he'd trained, he'd gone back for a little leave before shipping out again and then spread it. Spreads rapidly, and all ma major urban areas in North Dakota are hit right around the same time. So here's a picture of Wild Bill Langer as a U.S. Senator. Incidentally, he became governor after being Attorney General and for some kind of iffy things he was doing, he was removed from office, <laughs> and then he becomes a senator because he was kind of absolved of the kind of funny things he was doing that got him removed from office. Interesting guy, and, and something else is kind of interesting since I'm a West Virginian, uh, he was the last senator to lie in state in the Senate until Robert C. Byrd from West Virginia in 2010. So he died, was laid in state in the Senate in 1959, the next one's Robert Byrd in, in 2010. So there were restrictions. C.J. McGurn, who was the state health board secretary, sent letters to any communities affected by the flu. And he told them, quote, discontinue all public meetings, close all schools and places of public amusements. Wasn't bars because they had, it was a dry state. They had prohibition, but they had pool halls, so you couldn't go there. Uh, the Surgeon General, Rupert Blue, said that stopping the spread of flu was a, quote, war measure, okay? So you don't want to go against war measures, so you need to comply. And generally, until after the war, there are not a lot of complaints from people. So this takes place as public officials said there was nothing to worry about, which, as I said before, that's not a good thing to do. And Barry points that out. You tell people not to worry, and a lot of people are getting sick and dying like that, it's time to worry, <laughs> you know? And there's kind of a parallel with Spanish flu and COVID-19 in this regard, you know? Anthony Fauci, you don't need to wear masks. Nancy Pelosi, you know? Go to Chinatown, shop, it'll be great. Nothing to worry about. Donald Trump, 15 cases down to zero shortly. Don't worry. And we all know within <laughs> like a week, guess what? Don't go anywhere, stay home you know, and all that. So what, what do people do when that happens? Nothing to worry about, but now stay home. People worry more than they would have otherwise if you'd have just been up front with them. People lose, uh, you know, credibility with the public, especially if they are in a position of, you know, public trust at that point. So Grand Forks, Fargo, Minot, Bismarck, all the major cities, and that's like 10 to 20,000 if that's a major city to you, not a whole heck of a lot bigger than Colby. <laughs> but uh, other towns also institute public meeting bans on or around October 7th to 10th. Uh, it affects businesses. The Fargo and, Morga Fargo and Moorhead Street Railway cut three lines out of service. Not because the government told them to, but because they didn't have enough people to run the lines because they were sick. Um, you have a situation where the Northwestern Telephone Company had, quote, hardly enough girls to operate the switchboard because so many were sick. The state prison's warden decides to set up a quarantine there to try and keep the flu out. Uh, UND was going to, th UND means the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks. Uh, they threatened to set military guards at the university entrance to keep people out. Part of this is tied to the military because they have a student army training corps there, the SATC, which was big. Uh, the idea was we'll just train college kids to be officers and so forth. So 
they were trying to kill two birds with one stone, but like 6% of the UND population died within a three-week period, to give you an idea how bad this is. And keep in mind that, you know, UND kids are like 18 to 21 years old <laughs> for the most part. Uh, the 1918 football season at UND is canceled, and in the media guide it says it's because of, quote, war and influenza. There are only two other years where there was not a football season, 1943 and 1944. I think you can figure out what that was. That would be World War II. Um, as a little side note, the World Series ended on September 11th, right when the flu was starting to spread in Boston. The Boston Red Sox won that year, led by a great pitcher by the name of Babe Ruth. Actually, he's more known as an outfielder for the New York Yankees who hit a lot of home runs, but he was the pitcher for the Boston Red Sox at the time. They shut the World Series, or they shut the baseball season down early so that baseball did not seem like it was making light of the war effort. So that's a little side note there. There were some mask orders, some mask requests, their spotty adherence at the time. Uh, some Grand Forks restaurants, for example, refused a mask requirement for food handlers. I would have been kind of irritated with that because I don't think I would mind food handlers wearing masks all the time because I don't really want snot and coughing stuff in there, even if flu's not going around. But anyway, uh, here's masks on Seattle policemen, so what it looked like at the time. Uh, they don't really look like the N95s, uh, but they are put in place in places like San Francisco, Seattle, and other parts of the country, again, as a war measure. Other developments, uh, the Red Cross asks for volunteer nurses. They open temporary hospitals in North Dakota. There's one in a dorm at UND. I think there's one at a dorm at the North Dakota Agricultural College in Fargo, which is now known as NDSU. Uh, there is one in Odd Fellows Hall in Williston, I believe. So there are several of those set up in various parts of the state. There are coal mining shortages, not because the state is saying shut down, but because there's not enough people to work the mines. Lignite mines near Kenmere close in November. This is right before winter hits, and I don't know if you know this or not, winters in North Dakota, not the best, right? They're pretty hot. Uh, I'm sorry, pretty cold, very cold, very frigid. Um, so there are calls to save fuel for the winter, probably not the best thing for North Dakota. Uh, public funerals were banned in East Grand Forks, Minnesota, uh, which is right across the river from Grand Forks. It's apparently ignored because public health officials were complaining and telling people to comply in the paper. Fargo ministers, this is one of the few instances, ex except for the, the restauranteurs in Grand Forks not requiring the mask. This is the only sign before the war's end where I see that there's any opposition really, but Fargo ministers send a letter to the state health board they're asking them to end the ban on churches and other public meetings at the time. So perhaps my argument is their standing in the community as ministers, you know, allows them to make that statement, whereas other people might, you know, come afoul of the Sedition Act. Jamestown has concerns over the milk supply there because one of the recommendations is drink a lot of milk. And milk production's down because not enough people to milk the cows, basically. So as far as ending the public meeting bans, uh, Fargo is the first opening churches on, or I'm sorry, November 3rd. They opened schools on the, the 6th. Jamestown ends their ban on the evening of November 9th, so churches can meet on the 10th. Uh, Bismarck allows churches to meet on the 10th, but they schedule a victory celebration. World War I has ended on the 11th day of the 11th month at the 11th hour, Armistice Day. But they, they cancel that because they're afraid of a recrudescence and a spread of the flu. Grand Forks is last open seven weeks after they close down on Monday, November 25th. There, five local ministers actually put a petition into the local paper saying, don't hold this Thanksgiving service with all of these churches because we might have a spread of the flu. Schools there don't reopen until January 6th. So they're like, schools will open. Oh, wait, we were kidding. They'll open next week. Oh, wait, we're kidding. They'll open next week. Oh, wait, we're, we're kidding. They'll open after the new year, basically, <laughs> is the way it went. Um, so that's like three months after they actually closed down. 
some schools close into 1919, not for a long period of time, but okay, we've got a recrudescence of the flu in the area. We have too many teachers out sick with it. Um, it's not always clear whether it's we're trying to stop the spread or we don't have enough teachers to hold school in, in some instances. Uh, but that, that's going to go on there. As far as treatments, that's something else I looked at. Milk, lemons, and onions are recommended. There is a, an article, short article, that t tells of a farmer in Brainerd, Minnesota, who basically ate onions and stuff infused with onions all the time. His family avoided it, his wife and two kids. So now everybody should just start eating lots of onions. Um, lemons, there's, there's a, an advertisement, hand the flu a lemon, milk, Patent medicines are <laughs> advertised in papers, and that is a scary picture as far as I'm concerned. I, if I see that, I am not taking whatever this nurse is offering. Uh, but some of these patent medicines, I, I researched some of that, and they go back to the colonial period and even Britain before that. You know, people smelling the proverbial or selling the proverbial snake oil, <laughs> right? Some of these things have strychnine and sulfuric acid in them, and they're supposed to cure you. Uh, some of it has massive amounts of alcohol in a prohibition era, uh, but you can use it as medicine. We're talking, you know, brandy, port, uh, whiskey. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're not drinking. We're just taking Peruna. Have another, <laughs> you know, down it. Many of these things are purgatives, and what I mean by that, they're intended to, uh, shall we say, loosen your bowels up, okay? Give you diarrhea and clean you out. If you notice here, it says, many who think they are healthy and need a system cleanser or tonic. That's what they're talking about. And uh, Dr. Pierce's pleasant pellets were supposed to do this and other things. Um, so those are some of the major treatments. They're advertised in the newspapers. Uh, one judge goes for the flu cure, straight whiskey. He tries to import it in the state. Attorney General Langer is like, no, because you need a prescription for that because we're a dry state. But he's like, I'm a judge. Langer, the chief law enforcement officer, says, I don't care, <laughs> basically. Um, there is a flu vaccine. Uh, it's intended to fight Pfeiffer's bacillus which is a bacteria that causes pneumonia, right? They can't see the flu virus. They have an idea that a virus exists, but they've never seen one. Um, Pfeiffer's bacillus shows up in some flu patients, but not all, which goes against Robert Koch's um, postulates for disease-causing agents, which says basically, if something is going to cause a disease, it has to show up in all cases of the disease before you can say it's causing the disease. So Pfeiffer's bacillus shows up in some cases, but not all. So anyway, historians and medical professionals say it might have helped some because not, because not because it killed the flu, but because it kept people from getting secondary pneumonia in the case of Pfeiffer's bacillus. So that was developed at the Mayo Clinic, distributed throughout North Dakota. Some people have posed it. There was a sort of anti-vax movement at the time. This one lady, Laura C. Little, spoke for the North Dakota Freedom League, and that's how they spelled it. I would usually spell with the capital L. It's not a typo. That's how it was spelled in the paper, okay? Uh, but she believes smallpox vaccination had killed her son. So he got the smallpox vaccination. Then he caught a catarrh of severe and stubborn kind. It's drainage, mucus, bronchitis, okay? That's not one of the side effects of the smallpox vaccination. There are some. Some people died from it, but that's not it. Later, he got measles and diphtheria, so sure, it was the vaccine. It's, you know, measles and diphtheria are not tied to smallpox, totally different germs, right? But she was convinced it was the shot. So she goes around, distributes this thing called the Truth Teller that called Army Vaccinations for the Smallpox, quote, graft in patriotic disguise. That falls afoul of the Espionage Act, which says you cannot speak against the war effort. <laughs> so she's locked up for that, okay? Um, it is totally unconstitutional, by the way. <laughs> it's not the first Espionage Act, though. There was a Sedition Act in the 
18th century, the, the Adams administration that was put into place that uh, basically said you can't speak ill of the government or we can lock you up. Both unconstitutional, but they're in place for a bit. Um, and she's not the only one that gets locked up, as I'll point out here in a minute. So anyway, uh, that Truth Teller magazine that she's given out just happens to be tied to this guy, D.W. Enzen, who is the owner of Enzen Remedies, a patent medicine firm. So that's probably a graft that's not so much <laughs> in patriotic disguise. You know, here, have a shot of whiskey. That'll help you. Anyway, uh, as I said, it's a political campaign that year. It's an off-year election. So the president's not up, but state house officials are. The governor in North Dakota is elected every two years at the time. The state legislature, the House of Representatives. Uh, flu bans do cut down on campaign events. Uh, some places say, don't show up. Other places are like, show up, but go outside. Some people are like, okay, it's political meetings. We have to do that because, you know, it's America and stuff. So context for this political campaign, uh, you have the rise of the Nonpartisan League. I got it uh, denoted by the MPL there. The Nonpartisan League is kind of interesting. It's an actual socialist party. They're advocating not for higher taxes to pay for this social program. They're paying for actual government ownership of the means of production <laughs> in terms of a state-owned flour mill and elevator for North Dakota. They're seen as radical, but farmers really dig them. And they're started by this guy who was a legit socialist. He ran for the House of Representatives in North Dakota as an avowed socialist. Not, you know, your Bernie Sanders social Democrat kind of guy. A straight up, I'm a socialist. Arthur C. Townley was his name. He comes up with this idea. We're going to use the primary system to our advantage. Uh, the, the, the state had put forth, the, the voters, uh, 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 an initiative to basically have the state build that flour mill. It passes three to one before the MPL. Uh, but the state legislature, who was tied to business interests and so forth, they're like, we don't like that idea, so we're just not going to do it. So he comes up with this idea, use the primary system. So if a Democrat is running in a Democratic-leaning uh, county or district, he agrees to support our industrial program. We'll throw our support among, uh, you know, behind him. In a Republican-leaning county, if a Republican says that they'll support our industrial program, we'll throw our support behind him. And it's always him at the time, you know, this is before women have the right to vote. Um, so they win in a landslide in 1916. They win in a landslide in 1918, uh, and people come out for them. So anyway, uh, some people like S.J. Doyle, Stephen J. Doyle, who's running as a Democrat for governor, he ignores the restrictions. John Miller Baer, who was with the MPL, he was a cartoonist for the nonpartisan leader, the, the official paper of the nonpartisan league, and then he becomes a congressional, uh, you know, he, he, he goes to the House of Representatives. He's in the House of Representatives at that point. I, I, I love this quote from the Devil's Lake um, world and inter-ocean, it says, John Miller Bear, who misrepresents <laughs> the first district in North Dakota, uh, has given a speech. So whether it was the fact that he's given a speech in a pandemic or the fact that he's giving a speech as a socialist was a problem, I'm not sure. <laughs> but they didn't like him. Uh, Botno County Republican Committee canceled a talk, and I'm guessing the Republican Committee there was, you know, part of the MPL supporting them because they invited a, an avowed socialist to talk. Uh, this guy, Walter Thomas Mills, I included this because he had ties to Kansas. He had run a socialist school in Girard, Kansas. So anyway, on October 22nd, the MPL announces an end to its rallies effective on October 28th. The Fargo Forum and Daily Republican, which was a staunchly anti-MPL paper, said that that was because Governor Frazier, who was affiliated with the MPL, could not draw crowds, okay? Governor Frazier won re-election with 60% of the vote. So it's not that he's not popular. It's either they're lying or people are not going because eh, it's probably not a good idea to go out with the flu raging. So anyway, there have been three books that have looked at the MPL and its rise. Uh, Political Prairie Fire by Robert Moreland. 
that came out in 1955. Insurgent Democracy came out in 19. I'm sorry, 2015. It's written by a guy from I believe Michigan State, uh, who is uh, Michael Lansing. And then Terry Shoptaw in 2019 came out with Sons of the Wild Jackass, which looks entirely almost North Dakota. Uh, Lansing looks at the MPL. It actually had branches in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. The Prairie Province is all the way down to Texas. So, so Townley, who started the MPL, wanted to spread it throughout the country. But all of these books, you look at it, I read Choptaw's book cover to cover. I looked at the place where Spanish flu ought to be showing up in the other two books. They don't mention it. But it does have an effect on the campaign. It doesn't affect the turnout. Turnout's higher in uh, when compared to 1914. There was actually a small increase. Nationwide, that's not the case. There was a 10% decrease from 50 to about 40%, 39%. Um, the constitutional amendments dealing with the industrial program of the MPL and also the MPL trying to take over and, and, and you know put in play their industrial program probably led a lot of farmers to come out. Some believe the flu actually hurt the MPL's majority at that time because at the time the flu hit. We're into November. It's had a, a month to go through the cities. Now it's spreading through the rural communities. That's where MPL support was the biggest, which kind of would be surprising to a lot of people living today that, you know, farmers are supporting socialism, but some of you may have read Thomas Frank's What it's the matter with Kansas, right? And if you look at the populist era, the progressive era, people in the farmland were pretty radical in their politics. So anyway, the MPL wins big. They win all statewide offices, with one exception, which was a nonpartisan uh, superintendent of public schools or something like that. Every other thing from attorney general, state auditor, governor, they win it all. There are some irregularities, and they're tied to the flu. Uh, the judges of elections in Belfield took ballots to the home of six residents who were too sick to come to the polling place. They let them fill out the ballots, take them and throw them in the box. Some MPL guys who I think lost the election say, hey, that wasn't fair. And then the, I think it was the Democrats who were running against them say, actually, you guys did the same thing here. It goes to the legislature. They throw them all out. <laughs> so the, the, the votes are dis, discounted. Okay, So it did have an impact on the election. Uh, the papers are saying at some points that it looks like the, the returns are coming in a little slowly. But other than that, you know, people are still coming out to the polls. I looked at religious bodies briefly, and we're getting to the end, you know. So in the words of Liz Taylor, you know, to her seventh husband, I won't keep you much longer, right? That was a joke. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, I was looking at the North Dakota religious bodies, and... The Congregationalist or the United Church of Christ now had their records there. The Methodist Conference did. Um, the Baptists did. The some Lutherans did. And then you had individual church histories that are showing up at the place. So anyway, through reading the Grand Forks Herald and some other things, I found out the North Dakota Methodist Conference was meeting in Grand Forks right as Grand Forks shut down, like that very day. And they did some housekeeping. Okay, this is our president for the next year. This is where we'll meet next year and see y'all later, <laughs> basically. So they did not go through with the meetings, trying to keep with the spirit of the recommendations from the local authorities. A few ministers die. Uh, you can see that in the record. A few are remembered to service or for service in their community, such as R.R. Blodow of the Jehovah Evangelical United Brethren or the EUB Church in McCluskey. And he's remembered because he had previous medical training and actually helped members of the community uh, through helping the doctor there. And the church history that was written said that many members of the community actually appreciated the help that he had given. And that's something that was actually probably the best help you could give was giving people food and drink. You couldn't really treat the symptoms a whole lot, but you need to keep people hydrated. Uh, and if enough nurses are around to hydrate people, then you're more likely to survive than if you're left to your own devices and can't get out of bed. Something that kind of, I, I was wanting to see what kind of theological reflection, how do they explain it? You know, there's a worldwide war going on. And as far as wars go, World War I's kind of dumb. Should have been a, an Austria versus Serbia thing, but 
Germany wants to get involved, and then Russia and France and Britain want to get involved. Really dumb, okay? So I'm thinking, well, maybe they're thinking, maybe God's mad with us because we're killing literally millions of people, displacing millions more, injuring even millions more. Nope, none of that, okay? You look at the, at the religious bodies, and they're basically just like, well, we had planned to do this in the fall last year, but the flu kind of put the screws to that. <laughs> and that's all, all that you see for the most part. Um, and I, I found it interesting that the church histories, a lot of them have like little 50th anniversary histories or 75th anniversary histories, and it doesn't say anything for the most part about the flu just a very few like if the guy died as the pastor um, you're more likely to see oh the church was founded here with these charter members and in this year we built a church building and then in this year that church building burned down and and you'd be surprised how many of these churches burned down <laughs> at the time and then we built the standing structure that we have now in this year and that's about it so very little theological reflection on what god might have been trying to say through the Spanish flu. This is in contrast to religious leaders in other communities. Uh, they saw the flu as God's judgment. For example, Bishop Alvaro Ibaiano of Zamora, Spain, called for a novena, which is nine straight nights of evening prayers out in public to pray to St. Rocco or pay, pray in honor of St. Rocco, who is the patron saint of plague and pestilence. There's a public meeting ban in effect in Zamora, Spain at the time, yet he, he does it, okay? So minorities in Spain, uh, Native Americans, as I said, are by far the largest group. They die at a rate about six times higher than North Dakota's general population. So 0.2% of all North Dakotans died. About 1.3% of Native Americans died. Uh, reservation schools are hit hard. There are harsh quarantines put on the reservations, and the Indians are part, partially blamed for the spread there because, you know, the officials who are in charge of the reservations, the white guys are saying their houses are substandard, their sanitation is substandard, they live in close quarters. They don't reflect on the fact that maybe their houses are substandard, their sanitation is substandard, they're living closely together, partially because of their culture maybe partially because of government policies, right? Um, so anyway, I looked at Standing Rock Reservation as sort of a te test case. And this was kind of interesting. This is, uh, I said I would mention, you know, the, the, the archive in Cody a little bit later. This is one of those things that you find that you're not anticipating to find as a historian. Uh, I was looking at the, the, the uh, Cecil Underwood, the governor's records in West Virginia, and I found a guy who's a random Republican county leader in Texas in 1960 basically saying, you know, some people in our county want, you know, John to get elected and then somebody give him a bullet so Lyndon becomes president in 1960. Y'all know what happened on November 22nd, 1963. My jaw hit the floor. <laughs> this is another one of the things you're not expecting to find. So there's, the, I look at the, Ferdinand Shoemaker papers, and he's writing about the reports from the housekeeper, a woman by the name of Alice Irvin, who tells him about Dr. Lewis Eichhorn and Miss Ralston, who's the nurse, and that's all they call her, Miss Ralston. They got fired <laughs> because they're not paying attention to the actual patients in the hospital, and this is right before the flu hit, so it could have been worse on Standing Rock. They're not paying attention to the to the patients, the, the natives, they're paying attention to each other, <laughs> right? Um, she's always going into his room and coming out, you know, at odd hours of the night. Um, so it's a story, I say here, of sex, drugs, and, you know, guns, because uh, Alice Irvin says that Dr. Eichhorn comes out with a gun and points it at her and shoots it in the air and threatens her on multiple occasions. And then they're pretty sure that he's, you know, interested in, having improper relations with, you know, Miss Ralston. And also, did you know he's a dope fiend? I didn't even know people were called dope fiends in 1918, but apparently that's it's what they were called. So anyway, those are five of the things I looked at. Another thing was nurses. I left that out for time's sake. <laughs> Aftermath, 
uh, after the restrictions are removed, there's little desire to renew them. Some do occur for specific times in unspecified, like northwestern counties. Uh, a few in North Dakota uh, experience what's called the sleeping sickness after, or the sleepy sickness afterwards. Uh, if any of you have seen the movie with Robin Williams and Robert De Niro called Awakenings, these are people that basically go catatonic for decades at a time. That happened right after Spanish flu. They can't guarantee that's what caused it, but the timing's kind of curious. You know, a, a few weeks after Spanish flu, they basically don't wake up for 12 weeks. Some things that are not mentioned but were effects of the Spanish flu. Uh, some people said their senses of taste and hearing were kind of affected after the flu. Um, uh, Catherine Ann Porter, you may have heard of uh, Pale Horse, Pale Rider, which was sort of an autobiograph autobiographical, semi-fictional novel that she wrote. And she basically says everything has a washed out look after she wakes up from the flu, right? So I don't see that in the North Dakota records, but that's something else that came through it. Some people have lingering health issues. Uh, this guy, Easy Barley of Sentinel Butte, killed himself after, quote, a long period of despondency resulting from a depressed condition due to slow recovery from influenza. This guy was 38. That was that sort of age cohort that was hit really hard with the flu. Many people, like Thelma Traum of Hatton, remembered the impact on pregnant women. Pregnant women tended to be hit harder than just about anybody. So there were a lot of children who did not have mothers. Some of them get sent to orphanages because at that time, a, a, lot, of, a, a lot of times, dads would not you know, feel capable. They would send them to orphanages or to um, you know, relatives' houses to be taken care of. The official death toll in North Dakota, this is from the state's medical uh, you know, records department or whatever, the State Board of Health, 1,378, which doesn't sound all that much, and that's from 7-1 uh, of 1918 to 6-30 of 1919, fiscal year, basically, for governments. Uh, Perry Hornbacker, who's a, a historian who worked out of Bismarck State College, he surmises that the number may have been thousands higher because there were a lot of North Dakotans overseas or at army camps outside of North Dakota who died. But Anyway, to conclude, Crosby's argument is obviously problematic because there is a record of how Spanish flu affected North Dakota. Um, there were major outcomes in the state. These outcomes came from disease, they came from death, and they also included restrictions on public life. So for that reason, my argument is, you know, the Spanish flu had big impact on North Dakota and Crosby's at least partially wrong, even though he's a good historian. <laughs> good historians can be wrong at times, you know, about different things. So anyway, I want to thank you for being an attentive audience, and I appreciate you coming out. So thank you.